and it was just so ironic. You know, they named it after their wives and their girlfriends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this guy named it after the after the uh, after them. This is now. This is a whole thing of the uh, my whole career, and uh, it probably answers ninety of those questions you have in there. And then this is the tape. Now we have a group that comes out every quarter, so they publish this, mm -hmm. and you can, you're welcome to it. It's it's the whole that's the synopsis where I've been and what happened, and this is all the uh, through Bombardier School. I was in the Korean War too. Yes, I, I know that. From your and that's in here too. So okay, great. You have Thank that. You. This is your. These are your papers. Okay. Now I don't know whether you want this. Uh, this tape. The, all this is is that. So. Oh, it's a disc. It's a disc. Okay. Um, well, as long as we got. I guess as long as we have the. Paper no, I don't think you need it. My wife suggested I bring that along. Okay. Now these are some some memorabilia. These are. This is the first notice my parents got. When I got hit. Mm -hmm. Now I got hit in. Uh, no, that's that's the one that said I'm not recovering. This one was the one that came and said I was wounded. And uh, my uncle was a big wheel in the Chase Manhattan Bank, and his personnel man was a reserve officer in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. So when he was brought up, when it come up, he was a full bird colonel. He was put in charge of. Uh, personnel in, in London. Mm -hmm. And when the day I got hurt, the day after I got hurt, the terrible snowstorm. So, no, it was, it, was, it was probably maybe two or three days after I was hurt. They called me on the phone and they said, there's a Colonel so-and-so on the phone that wants to talk to you. He's your uncle's, he, your uncle is his boss. And he, I'm supposed to come up and see you and I want to know how you are. So, I said to him, move my bed over to the phone, which they did, because you didn't have... Mm -hmm. the, and then I told him, I was funny, he said, if you're lying to me, Lieutenant, he said, I'll be up there to see you. And I said, well, I'm talking to you, so I'm alive. <laughs> but uh, I, have, I had a, a head injury, I had a, his arm was all wired, I had a bullet in me, and my back was twisted. So I wasn't really uh, uh, it, 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 it close to being fatal, but I was laid up. I was in the hospital for seven months, and so uh, I got away with that. But anyhow, my, my, his phone call to my uncle, to my, my mother, and father got there before the telegram. <laughs> and the telegrams, you know, had stars mm -hmm. telling the, the deliverer they're dead, be careful, or they're uh -huh. slightly wounded or whatever. So I got two stars out of it. These are, the, these are the, uh, um, what they wrote from the prison camps. And uh, what we did is we made out we all went to school together. In, the, in, in our barracks, we had 14 people in the barracks, bombardiers and navigators. Then next door to us, we had the pilots and co-pilots. Now, why, I don't know why they did that. Of, of, that, of that 28, eight of them were in the same prison pr uh, place. They all got shot down around the same time. Mm -hmm. And so when they write here, they write like we were in, in school together and uh, the rest of your friends who were all, uh, I think, Duffy was our co-pilot, so of course the, the, uh, <laughs> the barracks over there was called Duffy's Tavern, as it followed. So those are, I don't know whether any of you used to Well, you can show us yeah, some of these. At, at, at the end of the bit, we'll have at you hold the them tape, up. we'll hold them oh, up. Oh, all right. We'll talk about them. All right, here's the picture. Uh, That's a picture of me. That's another okay. picture of me. And then I got, I got the, this was the crash site. Mm -hmm. We crashed on takeoff. And, uh, and then this is 50 years later, the same place. Oh. We, I went back. And we had a, an honorary member of the, 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 the bases that we were at was an ORAF base. And half of the Midlands were, were, were air bases. And um, they were owned before the war by Fergie's father, the Prince, Prince, uh, what is it? Prince Charles' wife. Uh -huh. Then they sold all that land to the to the the, the, uh, the, the Jewish uh, uh, bankers. Uh, the I can't think of the name, but they anyhow they they, they switched it over from the ownership to them. Now uh, the the farmers that were there were all tenant farmers. They never did own the land. They worked for the land. Rothschilds. I'm trying to think of. So anyhow, um, <laughs> the guy had just planted a, uh, a, a crop of Brussels sprouts, and uh, the furrows must have been this big. So they, I was trapped in the plane. They had to come back and get me. Fully loaded with bombs, a 3,800 pound bomb. It's maybe, oh, 1,800 gallons of gas, and probably 10, 12,000 rounds of 50s. So we were just helpless. We just happened to land. We could have landed on the field. We could have landed on a, on a, on a town. 
but we landed there. So this is the picture of the crew. Another picture of the thing there. So anyhow, that's that's the memorabilia part of it. Now, okay. what do you want to do? Okay, well I'll start uh, with an introduction, and then uh, basically you tell your story from the time you went in. We'll have some questions. All right. Okay. This is an interview with uh, Thomas Horan, the Days Inn, Hicksville, New York, 24th of June, 2003, approximately 1 p.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Uh, could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Thomas W. Horan, New York City, New York, 12-1-21. Okay. Uh, what was your educational background prior to entering military service? I had two years of uh, college at St. John's. Okay. Um, do you recall where you were and uh, what your reaction was when you heard about Pearl Harbor? We were playing cards and somebody said Pearl Harbor was bombed, so everybody had to find out where Pearl Harbor was. <laughs> uh, so that's where it was. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what your reaction was at all at the time? Well, I guess everybody, oh, there, there was eight of us there that day and everybody went to service within two or three months. Mm -hmm. So that was December of, uh, of, of 41. Okay. Um, were you in, drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Okay. Into the cadets. Mm -hmm. Why did you pick the uh, Army Air Corps? Um, I actually uh, never had flown. In fact, I didn't even drive a car then. And uh, I just felt that was a, if I was going to go, it would be a cleaner way than in a trench or uh, in the Navy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, where were you inducted? Mitchell Field, right over here. Okay, could you tell us uh, where you went to boot camp and uh, some of the things? The interesting call? thing about, uh, there were two groups of examinations, uh, and I was the only one to survive both of them. The second one was 13 people, and uh, then they said to me, you cannot, we cannot take you now, even though you've passed everything, because you're four pounds underweight. So I was 136 pounds, so they said, we'll give you two months, this is February, we'll give you two months to gain the four pounds. <laughs> I didn't get, I gained about three, I ate a whole bunch of bananas and water, and the sergeant wasn't going to pass me, and I talked him into giving me a pound. Now, can you imagine, for a pound, for a pound I wasn't going to be in the air for. So anyhow, we went in, from there we went to um, the, the uh, Aviation Cadet uh, Classification Center at uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And I wanted to be a navigator. I had taken 22 credits of math, and I had astronomy, and I had taken courses over at the Hayden Planetarium, but they needed pilots, so I ended up as a pilot. From there I went to, uh, prim well, primary was down at the Kelly Field in San Antonio. From there I went to Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and it rained every day, and we had two sections of flying. In the morning, the section flew in the, in, the, in the morning. The next day, it flew in the afternoon. And we were there two months, and we, we had barely any flying time, so they said, I'm sorry, we're going to have to wipe out that class. Well, I had soloed, and so I, they said, what do you want to be? And I said, I want to be a, a bombardier. Why do you want to be a bombardier? We want to make you a meteorologist. And I said, no, I don't want to be a meteorologist. We want to make an engineering officer. I don't want to be an engineering officer. Why not a navigator? I said, the bombardier is only is sh short by three months. Now, 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 this is 42, 43, 42. So I'm in the service nine months, and I still haven't gotten anywhere. So I went to bombardier school, and that was at... Um, Back, back to San Antonio, then to Houston, Texas, and then to Midland. Now Midland is where the uh, bushes all come from. from yeah. So uh, from there I got my wings. From there we went over to, up to uh, Afraid of Washington, and everybody gathered. The enlisted men, the navigator, the pilot, and co-pilot. And then we went through three phases. Afraida, which is Moses Lake. Then we went to uh, uh, Rapid City, South Dakota. Rantoul, Illinois, and then the Camp Shanks, which is up here in, uh, in um, Rockland County. And we left, ironically, for overseas on November the th uh, 30th, November the 11th, Armistice Day. And we went over on the Andes, uh, uh, Majesty ship the Andes, and its maiden voyage had been to Singapore, where it had uh, it brought in re uh, the re uh, reinforcements, and all of them were killed or uh, captured. We went over by ourselves, we got to England, and there we, we, were, we were a group, but they split us up, and I ended up at Polebrook Air Force, 351st Bomb Group, 508 Squadron. And uh, 
that was, we got there in the end of November, 43, and I went out, we were briefed about 12 times, I only got credit for four missions, we had recalls, we had uh, one time we were going to bomb Germany, and they said to sit down, and they put the new crew on, and it was the first time we bombed the A-bomb, the uh, 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 B-1 bombs, and it's super secret, and then um, I was hit, uh, we crashed, I'd gone to Leipzig the day before, uh, 11 hours we were up there, and that was, the, 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 there was shot off our wing and a pilot and a co-pilot, Lieutenant Crumpeter and, and Sergeant Mathis brought the plane back and they tried to land it with the wounded pilot, pilot the co-pilot was dead, and they were killed. Both of them got the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, the next day, we went murder incorporated, old beat up plane, and we took off. We were up about 10 minutes and we lost number two engine, and we couldn't feather it, so it went wild. We circled and we came in at the, the, the field from the wrong direction. The runway was this way, and we were that way. We lifted over the hangar and piled into this this field, the Brussels sprout field. So the the crash position is in the radio room. You got the bombardier and the navigator, you got the pilot and co-pilot, you got the engineer, you got the bomb bays, then you got the uh, at the radio room. I got as far as the bomb bays. The plane hit. I flew backwards. Uh, I didn't even know my arm was broken. And I got into the radio room and the five enlisted men and the navigator were there. I got them out and when I tried to get out, you, you stepped on a you stepped on a table and then you pulled yourself out and my arm was gone. So uh, the plane was in flames from one end of the wing to the other and I yelled and one of the sergeants, he must have been 30 yards away and came back. He was in danger. I jumped in like on a, like a, put a person on a horse and I got out. They dragged me and we probably got oh, maybe 70 yards away when she blew. And the amazing thing, it, everything, it blew, with all the inf what we had there, everything blew at one time. And most of it went over us. Some came down, but nobody was hurt with that. And um, I was brought to the hospital. And then I was in the hospital locally. And then they were taking me up to um, the mid Manchester for uh, operation on my back. I was in a full body cast. And uh, on the and in the, in the GI ambulance, you had a, you had three stretches, and they were held by by, by uh, leather straps. So I was in this one; these two were down, and the ambulance went off the road, slid down sideways, hit a tree, and I flipped on the floor. Well, the arm they didn't have right on the arm; the arm was all uh, protected. I was protected. The Englishman pushed the ambulance back on the road. <laughs> they put me back in and strapped me in this time. And off we went to the hospital, and uh, they, we, would, we probably went 15 miles an hour. The, the ambulance was almost bent in half, and they showed me where it was. You could just, instead of being this way, it was this way, where the Red Cross was. So we, we crabbed along. But when I got to the hospital, now I, this is like a week after, maybe 10 days after I was hurt, I had, the only thing I had seen was the ceiling because I had the cast on. And all of a sudden I could feel um, sensation in my feet. And I looked over and there was a gray-haired guy there, so I figured he was higher ranked than I was. And I said, sir, would you feel my feet? He looked at me. I said, I haven't had any sensation, but I think I feel something. So I said, feel my knees. And he, I said, wheel me up. And it was the first time, and the crash had knocked what it was the matter with my back, back into position again. So they took the cast off, they operated on me, and the uh, sensational thing, there was, during, before World War II, the... Uh, uh, sports editor of the Chicago Tribune uh, named the all American teams. And this surgeon is Harold Redbrick Muller. He was all American with University of California. He was a surgeon. And he and Brody Stevens, who was his assistant, had the longest uh, history of a pass at the Rose Bowl. So, now, I'm in the hospital there. The arm wasn't healing. The bullet wound healed. Uh, they up, they up, had operated. My back was okay. My head was all right. And they, and anybody that wasn't ready for full duty by May the first had to meet a board to decide whether they were going to keep you there or whether they were going to send you home because they needed the bed. So, I went. I came home, and then uh, it was inconsequential. I was sent down to. Uh, I was grounded, permanently grounded, 
and I was sent down to uh, uh, Midland, Texas, and then over to Big Spring, which is probably 50 miles away. Uh, Amarillo, out of the service, uh, back to St. John's, graduated, got married. We were recalled, and we, we, we went down to, uh, there were 17 of us down at uh, Camp Dix, and every one of us were in the reserve, but completely inactive. Uh, I had gotten a 40% disability pension, and um, we were, we were, and everybody was more than college educated. There were teachers, there was an actuary, there was a lawyer. So we said, well, something's funny here. They were all so highly educated, how did they pick us? Well, what it was is, after the war, the Marines were the uh, officers were the highest educated, Navy was next, Army, and way over here were the Air Force officers because a lot of them had gone in at high school. Navy had to have two years. I think the Marines required two years in the beginning for to be an officer. So that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to build up the, 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 uh, the, the, the level of the education. Well, off I go. I get sent out to Made the Field in California. And we were, we were taking um, reservists back. And instead of a man being a bombardier, we changed, tra trained him to be a, uh, also a navigator. Uh, a pilot we, the pilot, we trained to be a navigator in bombardier because the planes then only had one or two men. So the, one, the pilot had to be the pilot, the other guy was the navigator, the bomb, the bombardier. And then we were, we were training cadets. So I ended up as the wing, per, the wing personnel officer. Now, in a base in England, we had a group and four squadrons. Three groups made up a wing. Now, made the field was a wing in itself. It was, there was four groups, there was a wing, four groups, and 16 squadrons. It was a big, it was a big place. So there I was up there. Every month, the, uh, the, the, the general's adjutant would come over to try to get me to stay in. And I wasn't the only one. They were, they were trying to get other people to stay in, too. So instead of being 24 months, it was 17 months. And they let us out. And uh, that was it. I, I, had the, the, I had to waive the 40% disability or take 40% off my salary. So I waived, it, I waived the disability. And we had to sign a, a card to that effect. Well, being a personnel officer, when I left, I made sure I had that card so that they couldn't say that I voluntarily gave up my, uh, my pension. And I, there was no trouble. I got the pension back again. And that's it. Okay. So I'm going to go back on a couple things. Uh, you told us a little anecdote off camera about the uh, Plain Murder Incorporated. Would you tell us that story again? Oh, all right. Our, pla our plane was, was to be named, we had it on our jackets, I should have right. brought the jacket along, a murder in, uh, 10 Graves to Berlin. And that was an offshoot of a picture that was made five graves to, to Cairo. And the, it supposedly the German anthropologist had planted oil and ammunition in three places in Egypt. And as they went along, they just they dug them up and they used them. It was a open picture out of it. So this stuffy, who was quite a personality, he named us Ten Graves to Berlin, and uh, but the day so we didn't have our own plane. We flew in a different plane. Um, I'm trying to think. I forget the name of the plane we flew in the day before. But on a day we were hurt, it was Murder Incorporated, and I never did find out um, who named it that. Murder Incorporated, of course, was a terrible group of murderers. Uh, Alice, Albert, Alice Albert Anastasia was the head of it. Uh, Louis Lepke, another gangster. And they would be, they would murder for hire. They would be, they paid him and said, we're not going so and so. So, uh, the other part of the story is that uh, the day I got back was the 24th of uh, May, and my crew went down on the 26th of the Ludwigshaven, and the six sergeants and the navigator were killed, and the pilot and co pilot ended up in a prison camp, and they since died. So, of the 10, I'm the only one alive. Uh, the uh, Halloran Hospital was had just opened. It, it, they built it as uh, later on the infamous Willowbrook for for, for children that were uh, mentally retarded, uh, uh, crippled, and so forth. So instead of it had just opened, we were the first ones back, and they put us in this hospital, and everything was made. The toilets were only about two feet off the floor. The sinks were down about three feet, and the showers were like four feet because it was for these mm -hmm. children, probably children from whatever, probably three or four, I guess, maybe till 10 or 11. And then it became the infamous Willowbrook. 
don't know if they've heard about that, the terrible, terrible conditions they had. But at the time, it was brand new for us. And so, at seven months, I, as I say, seven months uh, in the hospital, I was released in uh, September. Uh, so from that February to September, and then I tell the story before going back to Midland and being a ground officer. Now you mentioned uh, you had a bullet wound. Uh, how did you receive that? What happened? <clears throat> when we, when we, luckily we didn't, we don't, we don't, we didn't uh, uh, arm the, the guns until we were up and in formation, and then we went over the water. We would fire them, make sure they were working. <clears throat> so fortunately, there was no, there was no bullets in the guns. Now. The gun, the, the the bullets, the 50 calibers. I think there's, I think there's three to a pound. I think that's the weight. Well, whatever. And uh, they're in, they're in like a, a aluminum uh, holders next to the guns. So the heat was making the bullets explode. The casing would go one way, and the, and the, and the, and the, lug, the, the slug would go the other way. And as we ran, the you could see the uh, where the bullets were hitting, but. They were not. They were just kind of looping, rather than mm -hmm. a 50 caliber would tear my whole hip off, mm -hmm. and that's what happened. But uh, nobody else got hit. I don't know why I got hit, but uh, I had it for a while, and then I, I, I lost it. And uh, when I had the 50, 40, I had 10 percent disability for say two years. They called me back and they gave me 40 percent. About a week later, I got a phone call from a doctor, and he said to me, uh, "Mr. Haran, I can get you another 10 percent." And I said, for what? And he said, a disfiguring scar. Well, this was a dis scar, and the head was a scar, but it wasn't disfiguring. He said, on your buttocks. <laughs> and I said, no, I, 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 was, I said, I'm lucky to be alive, and I, got my, I was going to lose my arm. But uh, the, the difference, in, uh, it was tremendous. You were getting another, if you got 10, from 40 to 50 percent, you not only got another 10 percent, but you got $58 a month for your wife, and you got $7.50 up to four children. So we're talking almost, in those days, it was probably, oh, 40% was probably $80 or something. So you almost doubled it for the other 10%. Mm -hmm. But I, I was content enough to get the, get the 40%. So disfiguring scar. <laughs> but uh, they took, they brought the, they brought the ammunition can to me in a hospital, and it looked like a huge uh, cheese grate mm -hmm. uh, where it, it, it had gone out. Now another thing that happened is funny. I'm in the hospital and I hear somebody calling, Lieutenant Haran, Lieutenant Haran, and I kind of looked over and it's an Englishman, and he's got a dozen eggs, and he says, "I'm the farmer. I forget his name. I'm the farmer where you crashed," and he said, "I'm here to give you a dozen eggs," and I said, "We well, blew up your farm." He said, "No," he said, "I had just planted the crop. Your government came, wanted my receipts for the last three years, paid me, and he said I planted a second crop." <laughs> So some good comes out of everything. <laughs> now you mentioned uh, you had decorated jackets. How did you decorate your jacket? What did you have on it? We had we had uh, uh, damn I it had the it had the three fifty first bomb group and then it had uh, the ten graves to Berlin and then my nickname was Irish so Irish was the thing. My daughter still has the original one. And uh, I had a, a new one, and I had it, had it painted. So it's 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 a it's an exact replica of the other one, except that it's much uh, newer. Did you have nose art on your plane? You know what? Nose art was your plane painted at all? Uh, well, the Murder Incorporated, of course, was on it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we were getting we were getting uh, the planes that were, the the the, rich, the ones of 42, 43, and 44 had uh, uh, were painted dark green or mm -hmm. mottled. Then they decided that was so much extra weight. They just we just flew in silver planes. Mm -hmm. So we did get a new plane, but we didn't have a chance to put the name on it. And uh, uh, I flew in round trip. I and I flew in uh, oh, uh, uh, that was that one Sharon Ann. I was down in Amarillo, and uh, the sergeant came up to me. He said, Are "You Lieutenant Ann? I said, "Yes." He said, "Do you remember me?" And I said, "I'm the, uh, he said, I'm a crew chief from one of your planes." I said, Jingles, how did you remember? He said, I remember you. He said, come down to the line. So, tomorrow. So I go down to the line, and there's the uh, Sharon Ann. Now, in there you'll see, we came out of, we came out of um, Ludwigshaven. Uh, first, we lost two engines. We were going to Ludwigshaven. We got as far as, um, oh, we didn't even get to the Rhine, uh, that little country that's there. I forget the name of it. And uh, we lost number two engine. That's over here. So we had to drop out of formation. And the plane that we were in, Sharon Ann, 
uh, were so old we had an auxiliary tank on one side in the Ram Bay and we had a box full of, a crate full of propaganda literature. I mean, we weren't even, we weren't even bombing. So we lost that engine, then we lost, then we lo we lost three and four, so we had to, see what happens when you, when you put extra strain on the engines, when you lose an engine you have to put, make up the others, and in doing so, three and four went out, and he started, he restarted three, even though it was smoking like hell. So we dumped the, we dumped the crate of things, we dumped the uh, extra bomb, we threw everything out of the plane that we could find. Uh, we, kept, we kept some ammunition for the top gunner, and we kept some ammunition for the tail gunner, and everything went out, and all of a sudden we kept, we went, what, 23,000, 18, and then we sat at 6,000, and there were full clouds under us. So we were just standing, we were going to dump into the clouds, we got in trouble. With that, it's part of that story, uh, we were calling, I, we were Crackjack, and I was calling Red Rose, that was the fighters, and they knew when we had certain, we didn't say we're over Antwerp, or we're over here and that. Uh, so we came, and all of a sudden, a P-38, which is a twin-engine plane, mm -hmm. all battered up. He comes in, and the planes never pointed at us when they came in. So they came in sideways, so we shoot at them. So he comes in underneath us, and he's sitting underneath us, <laughs> right along. And all of a sudden, a P-47 calls in. He said, I see you. I'm full of ammunition. When, it, when, the, when the fighters would go down, go on to the Germans, and they went down, they would go all the way down. They wouldn't try to climb again, and they would scoot for home. So you got plenty of ammunition, I got plenty of, of uh, uh, gasoline, I'll stay with you. And what he would do, he would go out, he'd disappear, and he'd say, whoa, Antwerp, well, get out of here, because you know, we had an aircraft, uh, uh, Austin, get out of here. So we got as far as the English Channel, and both of them were starting to lose, so they, we gave them, our Navy gave them their headings to their base. And we made it back. And uh, <coughs> this, and we're going like this, and... Uh, our pilot had been an Englishman born near the base. When the war broke out, he came home and got, a, got his commission. When he went back, he renewed his romance with his girlfriend, and they got married. So instead of landing on the coast, because the coast was just one big cement where you, you could just make it and then land, we go staggering at 500 feet all the way back, and they chew his fanny out no end. That we should, we, 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 we were not as flying. But uh, so the next day, we're called down to the line. And on the nose of the P-38 was Shorty. And there's this little second lieutenant standing there. He was the guy that had scored his pack. So Duffy picks him up and kisses him. <laughs> and everybody's looking. He's all, he's all red. But he, he stayed with us. And as I say, would go below the clouds and say, any aircraft, don't the Antwerp, Austin, or something else in there. Again, which we, which we avoided. And we made it back. So uh, then another time, we were going to Frankfurt. I was I was a spare bomber there, and we lost at number two. Uh, we, was was out of control, and what you're trying to do when the plane when the when the motors are going to stop the engine is you feather the prop, so that it's least re air resistance. Mm -hmm. If you don't get it enough, it it turns backwards, and it turns almost at the speed of the other two, and just tears the hell out of the engine at, at the great airplane. So we got rid of the bombs and incendiaries. We got rid of the bombs, and he said, uh, uh, we're going to try to make it back. And the plane was just pop. The thing was popping off. The rivets were popping off, and the, the tails go back and forth. We're in a radio room, and we're so low that the water is act actually coming in. The, the prop was chaining up. With that, the prop comes off, shoots up in the air and away. And he said, I think, and he, and he, picked, he managed to pick us up. And we didn't, we've got a ditch. And he manages to get us up in the air again, and we got back. No, you had to you had to get fired on, or you had to drop your bombs to get a mission credited. So uh, the, the Ludwig Sarven, we did get some flack at it, so we got that one. But this one to Frankfurt, when we almost got killed, we didn't get credit for that. You had to complete. You had to do either one or the other. Did you have any other questions? Yeah. Um, did you uh, when you returned home? Did you make use of the GI Bill at all? Yeah, I had two years, and I I, I use the other two. Okay, yes. To finish St. Yes. Um, did you ever use the fifty two twenty club? No, no, no. Um, when I got out of school, I went to work for um, Western Electric, and they sent me out to Chicago, and um, Western Electric, of course, was part of ITT or mm -hmm. Bell or one or the other. Western Electric was the manufacturing arm um, of the telephone companies, 
and I was supposed to stay in Chicago. Then they said, no, we're going to send you down to Texas, and you'll work out of work at Waco. But then they said, no, we're going to send you out to the West Coast, and you're going to go up and down the West Coast. And I figured, uh-oh. So I left. And then I went to work for the Equitable Life. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, did you uh, join any veterans organizations at all? Uh, the American Legion. Mm -hmm. I've been in the Legion since, well. How about the Eighth Air Force uh, group? Yes, I belong to that too. Mm -hmm. And for seventy-five dollars, you're a life member. So, uh, as I say, they have, they have a they have a meeting every year, and they have this quarterly uh, paper that comes out, a little small magazine type thing. Mm -hmm. Did you ever stay in contact with anyone that you were in service with? Well, what it was when we when 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 I came back, I visited uh, Duffy's people, in in uh, the, the co-pilot in Worcester, Massachusetts. I visited Joe Norton, he was the navigator who was killed. I visited his people in uh, Chicago. And um, when I was in the train over there, uh, I heard this cursing and swearing in one of the booths. And I hear this guy saying, uh, the damn people in the gray bar. I said, do you, do you mean the gray bar in Hollis? He said, yeah. I said, where do you live? He said, 21st Street. I said, she said, why? He lived across the railroad track, just a little longer on the railroad. So I visited his, I called up and I told him who I was. Now he was in a prison camp with Mike. There were eight of them. Then I can then I could rattle it off even now in the very same building. That's how everything happened at one time. So uh, I said to him, I told the people who I was. He's married, who I was, and I'd like to visit them. And uh, could I come over there tonight? And she, the woman said, Can we call you back? So they called me back, and this is like on a Tuesday. They said, Can you come over Saturday? I said, well, All right. So I, if I could have walked over the railroad tracks, I was still on 201st, but I had to go down to 206th and then walk back again, which I did. So as I get there, now it's, 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 it's in the summertime, um, maybe it's the end of, like this, maybe the end of June, and as I get there, I see a lot of cars parked. They had gathered the whole family to hear what I knew about George. Hmm. <laughs> I was shocked. But anyhow, I was the guest of honor and told them what I, what the, we, had, we had gone out to to Petersburg a couple of times together and I really didn't know that much about him except that I did see him and uh, I knew he was in the prison camp with uh, with my, my guys so uh, that was a little a little aside so in that in those they call them Kriegies that's what the prisoners were called they said there I understand you're the ambassador for the Kriegies I mean you did what you could visiting their families and it wasn't that much but at least like we had promised whoever got back first and then uh, a lieutenant, Dan Henry, was was the uh, uh, in my in the group with us from the beginning, a freighter all the way through across. And then, lo and behold, on the way, on, the, on uh, who who do I get in the next room with me is Dan Henry. He had completed his uh, missions, and he had gotten a silver star, which he deserved. So he had five air medals. He had the Distinguished Flying Cross, and he had the silver star. An eighty-eight had landed in a waste. And it, it tore the plane apart. The two, there was a big hole in the plane. The, pilot, the two waist gunners are draped over the guns, and they can see the, they can just see the tail gunner, but nobody's moving. And the communications were out, so they couldn't talk to them, and they couldn't get back to them because of the hole in the plane. So when he brought it back to England, he bailed out the other guys, and he and a co-pilot wanted to, le to land it, and they kept it up sun, so they couldn't see how bad it was. The colonel took off and said to them, "Whoa, we're going to lose you two, So bail out. So they gave him the they gave him the uh, 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 silver star, and uh, we had gone over with a priest uh, and on the Andes, and here we come back on the Argentina, and we had the same priest with us. He had gotten a coma, so they sent him home. So we all everybody had to carry two canteens full of water all the time with them in case we were uh, torpedoed, and uh, we'd have at least have some water. So the priest said to me, Tom, do you know any Catholics? I said, why, Father? I said, yeah, I know a couple. Uh, I dated this guy's sister, and it's Dan Henry. So we dumped our, <laughs> dumped our, uh, our water out, and we were drinking like 2.3 or something, whatever that mass wine is, as we came into New York Harbor. And the first thing you see is the parachute jump at Coney Island. And so Dan Henry uh, married my sister, and he died only a couple of months ago. So of that of the group going up, coming back now, as I say, he had completed. But of, of the twenty crews that had gone over, only three of them completed their missions. We were losing up until we got the P fifty one, which could go all the way to the target, clear out anybody around there, and stay with us. 
And but up until that time, the P-38s and the P-47s could go just so far, and then the German would jump us. We, and then that as we come off the target, they still couldn't come out to us until the, a certain point. So uh, uh, it was bad. It was, it was we were losing. We were losing quite a few crews. Okay. Um, how do you think your experience in the service changed or affected your life? Uh, not, I don't think so. I don't think at all. Um, I, I, I knew I was lucky. I figured if I, when I survived that crash, here I was trapped, and this guy was brave. They gave him a silver, soldier's medal. He would have gotten a silver star if it was combat. So they gave him a soldier's medal, which is actual heroism outside of combat. So it wasn't for him, though. And he, as I say, he was safe. He was gone. And yet he came back. No, it, it, it didn't bother me. I, I never had any dreams or any, any reactions to it. Uh, what's making me sick now is every time you read about it, the other kid getting killed over there with a mm. with a sniper, and of course our war was impersonal. You know, we were up there and we were dropping, and we never did see what what, what damage we were, we were causing. So, um, no, no. Okay. Um, do you have some pictures you wanted to show? Oh yeah. Well, if you hold them toward the camera, Wayne can uh, okay. kind of focus on them. And you can hold it back a little bit. Yeah, and, I'll, just, I'll just get the. Yeah. I can I can hand them to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. The, we'll get the one on the right first. No, when was the one on the the right taken? This one. Yeah. Yes, yeah, the right. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, this was uh, today. No, December of 1944. Okay. All right. And, and this was in, in, uh, in training. We were in we were in the cadets. And what year was that one taken? This was taken in uh, 40, 43. Okay. <clears throat> All right. You want to explain to us what okay, that is? This is this is the army. It was the army air corps in those days. Official. Um, Photographs. That's what's left of Murder Incorporated after we crashed, about two miles from the base, in a place called Andal, uh, England. And uh, everybody got out safely. I spent seven months in the hospital, but the pilot and co-pilot had their faces cut up badly, and one of the enlisted men had a twisted shoulder. Shoulder. This is the same field in 1995. We went back to visit the uh, crash site. Um, the uh, an Englishman had uh, kept the um, the master hangar as a feed and feed and grain business, and he's an honorary member of the 351st. So anybody that goes over there, he takes them around. So he was the one that escorted us to the crash site. So the original hangar is still standing. The original hangar is still standing. Uh, we when we came in at it, the tower is down here. It's two stories. And they were just jumping out of that. We lifted over that, lifted over this hangar, and then uh, went into that field. This, this is the, this is the crew. Uh, where's that big picture? That has a. Okay. This is the crew. Originally started out. Uh, this is me, bombardier. Joe Norton, the, the navigator. Bob Taylor was the pilot, and Jim Duffy was the was the co-pilot. Uh, all the rest, they're all they're all dead, all gone except me. Six of them were killed at one time. Seven were killed at one time. The navigator and the enlisted men, and Duffy and the uh, was another pilot at the time. We were in the prison camp together. Is the person that pulled you out of your plane in that picture? Sergeant Ori Vance, O R R I E V A N C E. He took, he came back and got me out, and they gave him the uh, soldier's medal, which, if it had been in combat, it would have been a silver star. So, <coughs> excuse me, the soldier's medal was for mm -hmm. heroism at non-combat. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much for um, Okay. Oh, those uh, telegrams. You want to hold oh, those oh, up? Oh, to yeah. Let me see if we can get copies. Okay. Let's see where's the first one. 
All right. You want to explain to All us right. what they are? The first, the first telegram was to my father. Regret to inform you, your son, Second Lieutenant Thomas W. Haran, was on 21 February seriously injured in action in England. Uh, uh, mail address will follow. You will be advised of his condition. And this is a month later, 18 March 94. Dear Mr. Haran, I regret to inform you that a report has been received from the Theater of Operations stating that on 1 March, the recovery of your son, Second Lieutenant Thomas W. Haran, was not proceeding satisfactorily. Please be assured that everything is possible is being done to respect this uh, speedy recovery. You will be kept informed. Okay. Anything else, or is that it? I guess the, the, the prisoner of war, the, the, these are the letters that they got the, the prisoners of war. Oh, okay. <coughs> we got two of those. It's funny. It was funny digging these things out the other day. I had forgotten where half of them were. Oh, that's right, one of them. Hold it so I can see. All right. Let's see. Now, were those probably they were censored too, the, weren't they? These were censored very carefully. These are what the prisoners of war were allowed to uh, write on. Uh, you might say they were uh, postcards. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the one barracks in Stalag 7, which was near Sagan, uh, Germany, it's near Berlin, S A G A N, I believe it's spelled. Uh, that's where they were, and they went down the 24th of. Uh, 25th 6th of April, May of uh, 44, and they were released in April of 45, American troops. But uh, this was, we had to make out that we were classmates in, in school, that we were not uh, fellow officers. I don't think we fooled anybody. So this was the, this was the card and to me. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay.